All right. Well, tonight, as always, I will be channeling for myself. <laughs> and, of course, for you, and secondarily for life. <clears throat> well, tonight, what I thought, well, I thought we'd be talking about, I don't know what we'll be talking about. <laughs> Well, I know one. I, we have some real the questions left. Well, here's one. I say one out of all of these because, to tell you the truth, the rest of them are pretty iffy. <laughs> Which reminds me, does everyone know it was a joke, a humorous anecdote presented as non-apocryphal? In other words, it's supposed to actually happen. There was a well-known jazz musician who had for many many decades all of his professional life had the reputation of having never taken a request adamantly refused and supposedly he was playing in some little club in boston and it turned out it was his 85th birthday and he still out there on the road humping it playing one-nighters or you know playing clubs and they surprised him with a birthday cake and, you know saying happy birthday to him and the old guy kind of looked off, you know, almost maybe like he was touched. And he said, oh, all right. He said, after all these years, I'm going to tell you what. I'll take request tonight, first time. And there's a gasp because people actually followed the man. You know, his career, it was serious people that would show up. <coughs> and the first thing that came out of the audience is someone called, do feelings. <laughs> And supposedly he looked off and said, God damn, no wonder I don't take requests. And fell right into playing back home in Indiana like he intended to anyway. You know, life is a lot like a musical joke. Uh, but not enough to take note of it. Well, here's one of the questions. This one did stand out. I I wasn't discounting the rest that me doing it sort of led into telling that humorous anecdote. But here's one of the questions that did strike me. Would you say something about the care and maintenance of one's internal voices? Yeah, kill them. <laughs> See what I mean? Uh... Well, back to where we were, what we were going to talk about. How about this, since we didn't know? How about a subject? Pretension as a way of life. <laughs> recognized and unrecognized. How about... How about in general, how life may be backwards from the way that's normally perceived? What if it could be backwards and the other way around from how it is unusually seen? Not just normally seen, not just saying that everyone else is an idiot and that ordinary views and perceptions are invalid. But as you people know, what I'm about to say, I guess... I may be about to say, talk about, it's still based on the fact that I've got no axe to grind, which if a man has no axe to grind, it's uh, very problematic whether he'll ever become well known as an axe grinder. <laughs> because the ordinary mind cannot make it much sense out of what's going on if you do not take some position. But this, I guess I could start off and it would sound like some position. I could point and you could say, yeah, I could hear somebody doing that. But then understand that it's not a position. 
we have talked enough that you could almost make a passing verbal case for saying that this sort of thing, at least the way I've been talking about it, is almost a deconstruction of ordinary life or an analysis of ordinary life <laughs> to such a point that you've dissected the mother to death. Like, come here, let me examine you. And you've thrown life up on, or at least civilized ordinary life up on the examining table, and you're still off doing that, which is not all that untoward or unusual, poking a little bit, wrapping it on the knee, drawing a little blood, looking at its ears and its mouth and other orifices. But you could almost say that you can do it to the point of examining life for its own good until the son of a bitch dies right there on your table. Side note, you should be so lucky. <laughs> but see, there's an example. You can almost make it sound, because that's true. If you just talk about life or the ordinary mind couldn't go with that, they'd have to say ordinary things or specific things. They would have to say, well, now, if you take anything, religion, education, morality, and you talk about it enough, even under the guise of it being objective observations or pretty cold-blooded observations, if you do that enough about anything, it'll begin to sound, if not foolish, it'll sound uh, contradictory within itself, it will begin to come apart. You can do that with life. It's just that the mind would say, well, you can do that with any particular thing. You can do it with life. But uh, I was going to say that there are things, well, since it's just us and not things, it's everything. You can see from a way that would be backwards from the way that everyone else sees it, which is not hard to do because if you're ordinary, you can then say, well, I have a more correct position that I am counter to this fallacious claim. I am the well-meaning, necessary balance to this kind of unprofitable, ill-directed thinking. Uh, but I want you to see that you could take a position that, just for the sake of us talking, that we had a group of people who have some better than routine insight and did not simply see life as being composed of opposites, that we might have some better view, something more approaching an objective view, and therefore would have to be some way more correct. That could be incorrect. How about, for instance, it is now accepted by ordinary people, by sane people, it is an accepted fact that men have a sexual desire for their mothers and thus wish their fathers harm. Not to the point that you're psychotic, but now as all of you, you're well read enough to know that now that is considered the norm. What if we said a person who was a little more conscious did not share this experience? Now you gotta listen fast. Well, you can listen to any tempo you want to. <laughs> now, you, you got to hold a scenario so I don't have to keep making hand gestures and talk slower. <laughs> Could you talk a little faster? Well, it's an accepted fact. We're not talking about a book of case histories of those uh, considered to be clinical abnormal. You understand? It's now considered the norm. I mean, it's an accepted fact. It's like it took modern day psychological, psychoanalytic techniques and research to simply bring it out because people like Freud and his followers, the whole ilk, just using them as the Western springboard, accredited springboard for this, they can look back and find you know, the writings of Sophocles and 3,000 years ago, they find, in fact, they took some of the terms out of the Greek tragedies and Greek writings, but they can see, well, hey, back then or in the Old Testament, there were people writing about this same thing, but it came out mythologically. It came out as dreams. It came out as phantom choirs singing in the background of some man's life. But now we see, and I'll bring it up to date, 20th century. Today, as they, they would say, but now we see that there is nothing that unusual 
And they could describe it as being the kind of psychological, if not sociological, postnatal development of the human, and just referring to men, since that's how they got into it, that all just ordinary men, that when they're just little nippers and their psychology and their personality is not completely formed, they have, understandably so, since the humans have such a long gestation period and the human child is so much longer connected and dependent upon his mother than are any other of the mammals or any other creatures, that it's only natural that the, especially the son, the male children, develop what amounts to, even before they know it, a sexual longing for the mother. And then they develop, of course, when the father becomes to come in and gets in bed and the kid can no longer nurse and be that close to his mother's bosom, that it's only natural that he subconsciously, with no ill intent, of course, and et cetera, but developed a certain kind of animosity toward the father who now represents an intruder into his erstwhile, safe, secure life, and et cetera. Now, 20 or 30 years ago, as I, you can surely put your mind back, or 20 or 30 decades ago, but even in your lifetime, that sort of thing, if you'd said that out in general public, you would have had many people, decent, God-fearing men and women, especially women, go, <gasps> You know, and probably have the vapors and want to swoon. Like, oh, how shocking. You know, my God, you can't talk like that. And now it's accepted. What I want you to follow is an accepted reality. That that's simply the way things work. You can hear it anywhere. It's not considered abnormal. Just on the base I said, it's just part of the development of the civilized, sophisticated, contemporary human being. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. But then you could say, well, wait a minute. What if we had somebody who was not an ordinary person? Let's just call him a more conscious person, a more alert person, a more thinking person. Just not your run-of-the-mill guy. Like many of you used to look in the mirror and go, that's almost him or her. And we could say, what if we said, what if I spoke for this group of people who are non-represented in our state legislatures, late, late in the halls of our Congress? <laughs> or anywhere else. Of course, there's a reason I don't feel sorry. The reason they're not represented out there in public is they don't want to be represented. <laughs> Plus, anybody that'd vote for it, they would shoot him. <coughs> what, if this what if this extraordinary group, what if I spoke for them for the sake of pointing out what I'm going to point out? If we said, those people, men and women, but using men here, the sex is not that important, of course, but if we said, they don't experience such as that. They understand what they're talking about, because I just repeated it, I just made it up. I mean, I made it up on the sense I didn't study it or specialize in it. What if we said that this other group of people, that the men involved, do not have that experience? They read it, and they understand what's going on, they understand what ordinary people Learned people, psychologists, writers, etc., are pointing out, they understand it, and they don't feel it. Don't experience it. They understand it, but they don't experience it. Now, you've got to listen fast. Now, we could take one view right quick and go, whoo, well, such a group would be unusual because they are, they represent better mental psychological health, right? Except for this. <laughs> Except for this. The first part that I described is now the norm. The norm. I'm not saying it's not. It's considered the norm. If it's considered the norm, got news for you, monkey. It be the norm <laughs> out there. So it's considered the norm. And we said, but wait a minute. We have a man over here. You know, if I got unruly and I said, I know somebody. And I pulled out one of these unusual people. One of these, <laughs> what I call them, a more alert person. And I pulled him out here and I said, wait a minute. This guy right here, he's got a decent IQ, got certain talents, abilities. He's in good shape. And, you know, sound, stable. You just never seen him or heard about him. And he understands this. He understands just what you're talking about with this kind of complex and, you know, sexually desiring your mother and want to kill your father, etc. And uh, he, and he, he only represents, he's representative of another group of people. He has no such feeling toward his mother or father. None. Forget subconsciously and that he forgot it and, re, you know, repressed it. He never had it. He understands what you're talking about. He never had it. What would they say? Would they go, ah, finally. If that's true, we have now a man who is just naturally... Da dum, mentally healthy, wrong. What would he be seeing now rather than being rather than it being a good sign? He would be the one who would now be considered to be mentally ill. Would he not? Think about it. Now there is no such classification. 
I fear that you know, we've talked so long together. That's why I stop sometimes as you people go right along with it and you don't realize, I hate to say this, the useful ramifications. Because now you're used to hearing it. But do you understand that makes sense until you think about it in a certain way? That you would think from one view, and it's not an unwarranted view, you could say, well, they would. They'd go, if that's true, we want to talk to him because there, in some way, that may be a harbinger of the future of man. Because you're saying there's a man who is naturally in some way just already mentally healthy, at least in this one area, into this kind of sexual dynamics twixt his mother and his father. You could say that. And at first, what you were going along is why some of you could follow. Is you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as soon as I started doing it, some of you already knew what I was going to point out. Contraire. But also, beyond that, there's still another one. Notice that they never talk about such a possibility. It's never even arisen. Nobody's ever speculated. No one's ever done in the great world of psychology where they make big bucks, dress up, have suits and ties, decent jobs, get home early, get, at the, <laughs> get tenure and you're off in two or three months a year, all that stuff. These big time guys, I stood here in my ragged underwear and made this up on the spot. And I've covered it here in 10 minutes. And those people never even thought of it. Never thought of it. That's what should be interesting. They never thought. Nobody, no psychologist, the most sincere, studious, intelligent, learned psychologist has never sat around and picked out, let's just use this example since I've started on it, and thought, what if there's somebody around sane, what we call sane, okay? This is a guy talking to himself, Nobel Prize winner in psychology. The real person, not being sarcastic, he's sitting around and he says, what if there's somebody out there that by all other definitions and measurements that we have, is sane, whatever they call that. You know, that. He is not clinically neurotic in some measurable way. And what if in one area such as the Oedipus complex and its peripheral ripples, what if there's a guy somewhere that by all intents and purposes is just stable, just intellectually sound, middle class and sane, <laughs> and it's now an accepted fact. We all know that we felt that way by our mother and father because he's sitting there and he's convinced he does. He says he does. When I say convinced, I don't mean he's wrong. He accepts it. Yeah, I'm that way. He studied in college, and as soon as he heard, his professor said, all men do that. And he went, yeah. And the whole class, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fact. But he's never sat there. Now he's got leisure time, got tenure, big time, trophies on the wall, prizes. And he thinks, how can I make, increase my name? How can I write a new book? How can I come up with yet another theory of some kind to get me a second Nobel Prize and some more, you know, Free money. Yeah. He never, they've never sat around and thought, wait a minute. What if one of our cherished, one of our accepted facts, one of the tenets of modern man, or a man like the Oedipus complex and the dynamics of the whole thing I've been through. What if there's somewhere by all of our other measurements, a man who is absolutely not unseen, and that he didn't have that. What would that represent? I mean, psychologists and all the other so-called soft sciences. They will not even sit around, if you notice. You never hear about it because they don't. Sit around and play what uh, some of the physicists and cosmologists, the hard scientists, like to used to play, uh, used to call, I think, uh, mental games or mental what else. Of, you know, trying to speculate what, even beyond mathematical models, of trying to speculate and think, well, what, what would the fourth dimension, or what would the fifth dimension, if it was a physical reality, what would it be? Or what would infinity, where would you go when you'd gone as far as infinity go? Psychologists and all the other so-called civic, sociologists, religion, etc., sociology, they will not go in to an area that seems to have no real pertinence that they can measure. Thus, back to my famous psychologist, and he sits there, and he thinks, what if one of our cherished paradigms, one, or one aspect of the paradigm of modern man's psychology, the Oedipus complex, etc., if there's someone that by all other accounts is sane and did not experience that, and you got to agree, he would have to tell himself, you got to agree that is possible. There's nothing physiologically known that would bar that from occurring. What would that say about the model? What would that say about the man? Of course, he was really good if he was my kind of psychologist. He would also say, say, what does that say about me that I'm 60 years old and I never thought this before? Mm -hmm. 
Do you understand all I was getting at with that part? That at first you could think that what I was saying <laughs> ripped a hole in his pants. That you could say, well, the person that you, you pointed out that did not experience this, that was sane in other, every other respect, he would be actually a better person. He would be, in a sense, in a small degree, a super person, a superman. He would be a better model of what people should be. But notice when they now speak about that kind of Oedipus complex and the dynamics thereof of being just part and parcel of a modern man, they don't say that's wrong because everybody will stand up. Heads of talk shows, the head of the psychology department, they will stand up and say, well, you know, if he's teaching a class and he tells the freshman students, he describes the sexual desire for one's mother and the resulting uh, wish for some sort of vague harm to one's father, and maybe maybe a few kids just wandered in off the farm, and he sees them kind of do like that, and he goes, no. Nah. Now, I know it sounds maybe funny, but we're not talking about anything neurotic, psychotic. We're not talking about mental illness. We're talking about, all right, does it make you feel any better? I. Dr. So-and-so, yes, that's right, recipient of you know, 1989 Pulitzer Prize in psychology, et cetera. I felt the same. So don't feel, you know, don't relax. And everybody goes, well, all right. You understand? It's accepted. It is a part of the model of a man's psychology. You would think then that although it sounds funny, then you think, well, if that's even accepted, the only reason they bring it up is that in some way you've got to work it out. I mean, you can't stay there. You can't become a 30-year-old guy still having some kind of sublimial, much less overt sexual desire for your mother. And plus, you can't be wanting to actually kill your father. So even though that is understandable and it's just a part of a man's subconscious development, you've got to, they usually call it, you know, work it out. But you understand there is the tacit inference at least, or there's the admission that an acting out of this dynamic internally would not be a boon to a person. So you in some way have to work it out. So they are saying that that is not the ideal situation. You cannot simply stay there. So if we say, well, now we've got a guy here. That's, you know, he's 20 or 30, 40 years old. And before, before the psychologist says, well, has he worked it out? Say, no, 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 no. He never had it. He never felt that. He never had that experience. Now, do you realize at first we could be standing there overhearing this conversation and we'd think, well, the psychologist plus me, if it was you standing there, but you're going to say, well, he's going to say, well, I'd like to meet that guy. Because maybe that is the future of man there. That he did not have to work this out, you say. No, he never felt it. He understands it. He's read about it. Read about it at very early age. Knows all the terms. He can talk to you about it. But he never felt it. And the psychologist go, ah, that is extremely interesting because, now wouldn't you think, from one view, that the man, the psychologist, his mind, we're not talking about any particular person, that his mind, that aspect of civilized intelligence right there in that part of the collective, that that guy would go, now that is extremely interesting because now, if that's true, then we've got an example of the progress, the evolution of man right here on the hoof. I mean, there it is, what we're trying to treat, in a sense, although it's not a psychosis, it's just a natural part of man, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're saying that this guy is sane in every other way, would meet our definition, our measurements of a sane, good, working, self-interested, self-fulfilling person, yes. And he's never felt that. No, nope. he's just foreign to him, it missed him. Wouldn't you think the psychologist would go, well, that has got to be an example of the future of man because at least in this one example, this one instance, here is something that we consider to be the kind of subconscious, infantile, gradual developing dynamic that one must work out in some adult operational manner. And you're saying that he was born without that, oh, we don't call it a serious problem, you know, since I have it too, psychologists would think. That's not being sarcastic. He just couldn't look at it that way. He would think, not, not that it is a specific problem, but at least there is one of the areas that we consider that does need attendance. That it can be to the point that people do need treatment. They need to talk about it and work it out. Here's a guy that didn't have to work it out because he never had it. 
You would think that, right? Uh uh Do you see also that if you could get somebody's attention in the, that community, in psychology, that is that area of life's co collective civil, collective intelligence, to see and consider this guy, they would not look at it, even if you could hold their attention, which you probably couldn't, but if you could, to such a person, contrary to them saying that could be a model of man's future, of certain areas that we now consider to be, well, problem areas in one's psychological dynamics, and instead of having to work it out through analysis or drugs or introspection or meditation, he wasn't born with it. That could be the early birds, and we could be Capistrano. Would they be interested? If they were interested, would it be on the basis of that, what I'm describing, that he, that could be a very good sign, a favorable sign of what's to come? Uh-uh. If you could get their interest at all and they followed this, they would consider, wait a minute, that guy's sick. Yeah. And they might get interested then if you could get them that far because then they would, might begin to ring bells. Wait a minute, I see a new paper. Yeah. I can smell a new book. Cause, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, they've got people that's you know, got jails and hospitals and psychiatrists' waiting room full of guys that are still suffering over this to some degree whether it's just psychological or people that actually have killed their father, people who actually committed incest with their mother, all the way from that whole extreme, that whole spectrum. And they think all that, and somewhere in there is sick. You would have a new one because he'd think, wait a minute, no paper's ever been written. No reputable psychologist, and I would know about it if they were, has ever come up with the idea or ever come up with a new case, a new classification because everybody else, they got them. You follow all the way from people who say, well, sometimes I've had imagination about seeing my mother naked. All the way from that to people that kill their father and said, I'm in love with my mother. And I mean, that gets sick, right? But hell, that's an old story. Thanks to psychologist. I got a new one. Where is this guy? I want to interview him. Has anybody else talked to him? Because it would strike him, if you went this far, that wait a minute. I've got a virgin area to myself. We're talking about a serious new area of mental illness. You say that guy has never even thought that, never felt that? Oh. Nobody's doing anymore. Did I lose your... Do you understand that is more than how I started out saying that life could be in certain areas, if not in general, could be backwards to what people think? That's easy to do. But to take it to the point that you would, could almost, or you could begin from the kind of views that we try to entertain around here a few hours a week publicly amongst ourselves of not just trying to turn life inside out or trying to analyze it to death or deconstruct it <coughs> but to see that if you even take what would appear to be from a reasonable view initially a more objective a wider a more enlightened a more unusual view that all right, what we're going to talk about, the view, is not either that this, what public, what the general public thinks is wrong or right. How about this? Let's just take one of the things they think, such as the Oedipus complex. They think so-and-so is part of the nature of man. All right. Now, we could say, no, it's not. Psychologists don't know crap. They're just people that's too lazy to go through. Or they didn't have the attention span to go through theological school or something. <laughs> you know, not that. You can see both views. <clears throat> well, what if you say, wait a minute, we've got somebody over here. It's a possibility. How come you guys, pro or con, <clears throat> have never considered the possibility to be somebody as sane as you are, <clears throat> that you would have to admit it just on the surface, that's not even interested in what you are. And not just interested, you're saying that the interest is part an inescapable part of a man's individual evolution. And what if there's somebody who has not gone through that stage of evolution? I don't mean they're backward, because from one view they're forward. Because you consider this stage to be something that must be overcome, something that must be worked out, and he just skipped it. He was just born, and you know, he went bypassed that, and he saw it all, and he understands what he's talking about. And you would think, wait a minute, that's going to fit into somebody's count. One of the two would have to say, wait, how great. That what, from a, what you would think to start with might be a more enlightened view that you would say, well, that would have to be seen as a good sign. That would have to be seen as a favorable move in a man. What else could they conclude if they could even go this far with it? 
that you actually ask for some diagnosis or, well, I want you to meet this guy. What do you think about from what I've told you, doctor? And he doesn't say, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know what to call it because there is no clinical classification. But that person obviously needs help. Do you follow? Well, I can make it real quick just between us. We could say the psychologist. I can make him say, hey, if he's not that sick, you know, as the rest of us, God, is he sick? You follow? That is not the way they'd look at it. Because what they'd be saying, wait a minute, if, they're not, if he's not as normal as he, we are, parenthetically, as sick as we are, to be normal, then hey, he's sicker than we are. Does anybody know what I, the subject was? Pretension is a way of life, recognized and unrecognized. How about everything? How about everything that has to do with this, the world of civilization? Every interest, every intrigue, every hobby that is not simply an attack, that is not even an intellectual attempt to deconstruct, to tear apart, to analyze to death, religion, education, stamp collecting. What if you're getting nowhere, which you should know by now, is simply attacking, simply pointing out, boy, is religion a laugh? Our boy is religion, you know, the savior of mankind. But let's pick, it seems to be the starting place, if it is some form of criticism, like, boy, is politics a bunch of crap. <laughs> oh, I can make it positive. Boy, how important it is to be patriotic. How much pride, how much it means for man to have pride in his family, his race, his religion. What was the title? Pretension as a way of life. Where would you get, one reason that non-axe grinders get no repute, no respect, no money, no fame as being an axe grinder. That if there was another view of everything that people hold and dear and cherish, that uh, you're getting nowhere plus asking for trouble, but it's worse than that. You're getting nowhere personally to attack the things that ordinary people hold dear. Patriotism, their religion, their culture, civilization itself, their good name. And it's, it happens with everyday frequency that voices within the collective intelligence of man normally referred to as would-be artists, social critics, they're gnats. They're necessary, but they accomplish nothing specific. Who will get on a street corner? Somebody's down right now in a gallery in Soho or somewhere, Paris. Holding up a picture of the Pope and throwing dog feces at it, holding up a, making, presenting a statue that they've done of our president, and, you know, taking a whiz on it. You know all that. It's nothing new to go, hey, the middle class are boobs. Dollars. Boy, are they be taken advantage of by the conspiracy of whoever. So it's not that. If that's all it was. We'd all been out of here by now. We wouldn't be waiting for them to start the countdown again. It's always, it's not an old ring, it's, you know, with the weather. <laughs> <laughs> or the people, people over at Disney, the world of Disney, ask us, you know, if we wouldn't blast off today that they got a whole bunch of wives and kiddies over there and it, sometimes it frightens them. <coughs> so the attack on anything as you should know, serves no purpose. It does not enlighten a person. It does not give you any extraordinary data just to stick out your tongue. That's psychology, religion. But how about this third example? It's actually four if you're not counting. There's not an attack on civilization. And it's not a non-attack on civilization. It is to consider it, I mean, I could have left it there, but would-be mystics and Zens have been leaving it there for thousands of years. 
You can say, well, it's not this and it's not that. So where does that leave us? And the crowd of would-be mystics who didn't pay a lot to get in anyway are left with, hmm. And the guy, you know, pulls his cape up and goes, and leaves. If they got any good stage effects, maybe a little dry ice and a little smoke trails them out. And people go, hmm. It's better than that. In fact, it's more specific than that. You don't have to just consider, you know, what is the sound of the clap if a third hand was involved. We won't get into the possible side jokes inherent in that, but plus there's one that you people don't know about. It's how they used to treat certain social diseases by saying, well, lay it right up here on the table, sir, the doctor. And they had a little rubber hammer made especially for a purpose that we don't want to go into, which has something to do back with the sound of the third hand. You know. Rather than those kind of actual midway, that is, having to do with carousels, kind of would-be intellectual and verbal cul de sacs, you know, that, well, if it's not this and it's not that, which you people must be that good to see, and all the would-be mystics that didn't pay much to get in, go, yes, <laughs> then you've got to consider there is always the third possibility, the third hand. Then you leave. It's better. It's easier. It's more direct than that. It's don't just leave that. Well, everybody can't be right and everyone can't be wrong in a political argument, a religious argument. I'm trying to be a mystic and here I am in the midst. Here I stand right outside of Bangkok and I'm surrounded over here on the right by Buddhists and I'm surrounded on the left over here by Muslims. And they both swear that they know some sort of way to transcend the limitations of the human mind. But they both can't be right. Yeah. And suddenly a Jainist slips up and he says, ah, consider, would-be mystic, you didn't pay much to get in here anyway, that there could be a third way. And the guy, you know, and now you stand downtown Bangkok and you think that's got to be true. It's not. I've learned a lot from the Buddhists. I've learned a lot from the Muslims. And I couldn't decide. I knew that something was wrong. I could not take an arbitrary side at the expense of the other because there's so much. And they can't see it. I suspect that I may be more than a low rent would be mystic because I will not take sides like they do. I knew there had to be something else. And who was that guy? A Janist that said, consider the third possibility. Aha, uh -huh, and it strikes me. There is mucho validity to that. You understand? That almost seems as though we're on a new level of interpretation, observation, even conscious experience. But it's not. Because if it was, again, we'd all be out of here. They'd have been out of there thousands of years ago. Because they've been playing with that idea. Uh, well, you good Jews and Christians, you, the whole idea, you didn't invent it. Nobody did, but the whole idea, even in religion, of the Holy Trinity, that they can't make any sense of it, they can't let go of it. They keep talking about, well, God is one. There's only one God. You know, Moses almost copyrighted that. It ran out, and then other people cashed in. There's only one God. Get rid of all those other gods. So they got rid of them. He says, there's only one. And then pretty soon somebody said, yeah. See, it's the, it's the cosmology, it's the psychic, no, it's the physical. I'm trying to get something that would, you can get your mouth into. It is the un, unexplored, the aspect of the laws of physics come into play, and it keeps coming out as myths. But that very shortly after, there's only one God, and they went through this all over the world. This whole stage, uh, Mohammed went through it, Buddha went through it. You know, wait a minute, we, all these other gods, that, that's not the way it goes. There's only one. And that happened everywhere on this planet, find it one time, they all went, yes. And then shortly thereafter, the laws of physics come back into play. They, you know, it's like trying to stomp down the laws of physics and they keep sticking their heads up and people do this and beat them down. Now that's the hammer you use on the clap. Well, anyway, you try to beat them down. 
But very shortly after that, it comes up the idea, wait a minute. It's true, there's only one God, force, reality. Only one God, but he's in three parts. <laughs> and of course, and of course, all, all the good, sane, reasonable, educated people go, what? <laughs> Trust me. Which is all you can do because it makes no sense. <coughs> Remember, there's only one, but he's divided into three. <laughs> and they can still, well, they can pull it off. And it's not just religion. This is everywhere, in case you hadn't noticed. And I won't, if you ever want to look, it shouldn't, you can find it in psychology, sociology, economics, politics. Yes, even professional football. But <laughs> you can. The American League, the National League gave birth to the American League. And then what? Suddenly they said, well, let's have a Canadian football league. And they tried it, a third one. Nobody could understand it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, I think they call it in the Christian church. <laughs> Once you divide her, you know, you know Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Or, you can, you can, two of them you can deal with. Well, let's go back to Christianity. That, they're kind of general story. Right, God is one. So they all sit down for that. You know, what is, shortly after, shortly after. You know, Moses died, the copyright runs out, the state can't make any more shekels off of it. The laws of physics rears its nasty little point blank in your face head again, and it says, The myths started rolling again. And it says, Nah, God, he's one, but he's three. All right. Two you can deal with, because whatever the story is in the Christian world, it's like, All right. There was the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the Father is God. You know, and then they have to say, no, don't, don't, no, 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 don't, don't choke. Follow me. Trust me. Go with me. Work with me. God's God. That's the Father. But then he gave birth to a son. In this case, Jesus is a story in the Western world that came down to help us all, to save us all. Yeah, because you can see one turning into two. You can always see it. You can see it in math. You can see it in chemistry. You can see it in psychology. You can see it in the sexual development of a little nipper. One, you can see, all right, God's one. Now, if they just said, God's one, but he's actually two, which they tried that. But that was way back. I mean, that was even before the Greeks and the Mesopotamians. That's before they had such a rotten name. <laughs> because, because you can say, all right, God's one, or anything's one, but then it, it gave birth to something else. Because one is almost a static non-entity to the human mind. Because of the, our three-dimensional reality, and to make it move, one won't do anything. Although it sounds nice on the surface to say, all right, God is one. And at first, it's one of those things, again, like hearing psychology, explanation, you think, what a relief. Now I know the truth. And if they let it go, you'd sit there and you'd, very shortly you'd get edgy. Your mind would. Because at first it sounded like, well, now the damn thing's been answered. I mean, now I feel like I'm somebody. It'd be like saying, you know why you're here? You had a mother. <laughs> and you say, whoa. No. Or they say, the nature of the universe, the nature of man, is all dependent upon one thing. Just remember this. The universe is run by God and God is one. And everybody went, oh. <laughs> Trust me, that was a little dramatic because there is no readily available. I mean, I'm having to make up new myths as we go, as we stand here. Because, but that is what the human mind would do, is one, around the surface. It sounds like, ooh, the answer. But it's not, because one is dead. One would be static. And no matter how they interpret it, now I've set the mythology, if somebody adopts this, and they try to say, right, let's go back and see now in a new, higher plane that there, forget all these things about multiple gods and God being different aspects and characteristics. Let's go back to where we belong, but on your level, there is only one, one force. Of course, now they're trying, as you all know, you read enough, they're looking for the unified field principle, the one law of creation. And scientists, cosmologists, physicists now of the highest repute, or theoretically, or they say that they are convinced that we're getting closer, that there's going to be one law. They're going to type, you know, they now got down to the five basic laws, or they did last time I read, 
But there are even you know, several people now have claimed that they've got the, what is the weak and the strong magnetic force is the same thing. So that some of them claim we've got down to four, but they all say there's no doubt the way we've gone from having just humongous numbers of goddamn laws everywhere. We got down to five. They answered everything, and they have no doubt. They say they can feel it. They just, we get down to one. So it'll never happen. If we do, it's just going to be another cycle, and then we're back to Brahma breathing in and breathing out again, and maybe going, <coughs> and just, you know, he just, coughed, he just coughed out Stephen Hawking or somebody. <laughs> Or is that Moses with glasses on? I don't know. <laughs> if we went back, if you announce the force, God is one, at first it does. It's like, well, finally, if it would strike you as being correct, and the, the authority seemed to be there for someone to say, God is one. One force rules it all. At first, doesn't that sound like, well, finally, a simple, reasonable answer that we can all use, comprehend, accept? No, because it is static. So two, you got to have two. I'm still back. Don't lose the place. The idea of three, three forces, that God is actually three. Now he's one. You always got to remember that. He's one. Okay. But he's three parts. He's one, indivisible, omnipotent, you know, no early withdrawals, everything you ever thought. Just one. Okay. But he's three. Uh, you got to explain that. Can do. Can do. Life says. All right, God's one. Just one indivisible. It's just him. I mean, he's it. Gotcha. You know, no company, no corporation. He didn't have any help. We're talking about God. Okay. One. Okay. But now follow me. He's actually three. You're going to have to help me with this. I will. I will. Just sit still. Listen. He's like, we call him here. I'll go back to the Christian side. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is like he gives birth to some sort of local reality. Of course, now I'm falling into my terms, aren't I? God, in the Western tradition, gave birth to Jesus. Jesus was not a person. Jesus was a part of God. But in his you know, compassion for us in our sorry state, and we won't get into you know, how we got here and that sort but that Jesus was actually a part of God. That the Father and the Son, that one always gives birth to two. No matter what you heard it under, whether it was Christian descriptions, Hindu, or whether it was scientific, whether you were an atheist and you never heard it, if you say one force rules the universe and it was, had no religious connotation, you'd never heard of religion, you would still get edgy. Your mind, if you had a, an, just a reasonably operational mind, it'd go, uh huh, come on, come on, come on. And you'd say, all right, the one force actually had to give birth to another. You know, if the one force was a positive magnetic force, the force that created all was a. Proton. You go, go, oh, thank God. <laughs> and you'd keep waiting for the other orb of the atomic model to drop. Because you know one ain't going to do it. So, all right. God's one, but he's actually three. There's the Father and then the Son. He had to give birth to some kind of physical manifestation. That's the general mystical description. And so that kind of produced man and local reality or helped save man and give man. All right, got you. Because that's just it. One always has to have two. A three-dimensional reality of the mind would not work without the concept of there being two forces, good and evil, up and down, hot and cold. Mm -hmm. Except still everybody wants to hear, we will find the one. Well, you had the one, and then you, the mind insisted there's got to be two. But that wasn't enough. Yeah. There's three. All right, I got you up to the one and two. But you've got to help me. Glad, be glad to help you. Uh... Well, you got the part about the Father and the Son and God actually being one. Yeah, I heard that. And now I say it was three. Yeah, that's when you got to help me. Well, I'm trying to, but just I want to bring you up to date. Make sure we're on the same track. Okay. So you got that God is one, right? Got that. And then I told you it was three. Yeah, that's when I got confused. Yeah, well, I'm getting there. But then I told you it was two. I told you it was two that God gave birth like to himself or a part of himself, you know, to manifest himself and the force here and the great reality. All right, I got you. I went along with that. We're still dealing with the three, you said. Okay, I'm getting there. Okay, I'm waiting. Well, I'm getting there. Uh, uh, okay, you got the first part. About God. Yeah, I got that. And you got the part about God gives birth to like a form of himself, the one and the two. Yeah, I got that. But you said three. I know I did. Uh, well, you got to help me with that. Well, I'm going to. I'm going to help you with it right now. Uh, but you got the first part. Yeah, I got, yeah, I got it. Do you follow? There is nowhere verbally, mentally, in this dimension, 
to go with that. And yet they cannot turn the son of a bitch loose. And you could grab the Pope. You could grab the Jewish equivalent. You could grab, you know, says so the head of Islam, the Buddhist church. You could grab anybody on this planet, a scientist. Of course, they're working on it. And they'd say, well, get your hands off my lapels or I'll call a security guard. You know, we're trying to come up with a one force, but I don't need you disturbing me here in my laboratory shaking me about. But it'd be the same thing. The point I was getting at, you do know this, you cannot find anyone, the world's greatest theologian, back to that example, and say, this idea, whether it be Hindu, Buddhist, they all, they all suffer from it, no matter what you think. They're all victims of it. And you say, well, you teach that God, or the forces that run the universe, are actually three, that God himself, in the Judo -Day, Christian uh, Judaic tradition, <laughs> that God himself is actually three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, the first two you can describe. Yeah, yeah, we can deal with that. We're satisfied with that. We got, you know, we even got pictures, drawings, paintings of Jesus. We got physical descriptions of him being here, historical. And of course, God, nobody's actually seen the Father, but at least we got some idea because we are made in the form of God. It says right here in Exodus. Is it due to Domedary? No. None of you still like that one about their me fixing this team of prophets except their camels. All right. In Genesis, <laughs> that, uh, that God created man in his image, and so Jesus is just obviously represented a more perfected form of man. Oh, we got that. But if you ask a pope, a rabbi, anybody, and you say, what in the, what is this third, the, give me some idea of what the Holy Spirit, what this third force is. If you got them in a moment of lucidity, they would say, we do not know. They will say it. And I say a moment of lucidity. They would, it's like everything in the civilized world of man's intellect. They even. You know, Sam, I just made up a new description of civilization. In its highest form. Is being able to pass off a fart as perfume. <laughs> is it not? Because they will beat you to the point. If you say. If you start talking to a pope or a priest about. Well what's this thing about God is one. And then he's actually three. Because even if you mean it mythologically or allegorically or literally, the first two I can go along with. Even if you mean it literally, I can allegorically see God giving birth to a son or one producing a second. I, I, it just feels right. But this third thing, you know, what the hell is it? How can you explain that to me? When I was thinking about civilization at its highest, best speed is passing off ill aromas as a sweet fragrance of success. Would be them. They'll beat you to the point. And say, ah, there, there is the transcendental, mystical mystery itself. Because we all know that there are three. We do. Well, it says it's so all right here. We all know that there are three, and the first two, all of us, even you, just a lay person, just an observer of our religion, even you say you can understand the first two and comprehend the meaning, even if you take them, take it allegorically. Yes, I can. But you understand the beauty. Of the third is that it transcends even the minimal, the barest of the ability of a human mind to just minimally conceive of it. It's impossible. It's beyond the comprehension, the grasp of the human mind. <laughs> and if you go along with thinking, I smell shit, and they go, ooh, do you smell the sweet aroma of God's goodness? And if they pull that on you, you go... In other words, they've admitted beforehand, we don't know. But they turned it into a brag. They turned it into proof of their insight. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you follow? Now, don't take it as an attack. Remember, we're not here grinding axes. <laughs> Religion is not chicken necks. As they admit, the point being, they will admit under some guise or the other, whether they admit that it's part of the great eternal transcendental mystery of religion, etc., or whether they just say, we don't know. No one will claim to have any comprehension at any lucid moment of where this third force comes in. What the hell it means. What is the Holy Spirit? We've got a name for it. It says it here. They've been talking about it for thousands of years. Or in you know, Hinduism, they have another name. They keep talking about it. And the best minds <laughs> in the field will say, we don't know what it means. 
And if you just stop there before they begin to say yes, and that's part of the beauty, yeah, I know I've heard it. Here's the question, back to there not being an opposite position, at least one that's of any benefit. You've got to set your sights higher. Plus, you've got to get them askewed to the point that the word askewed is almost meaningless. Why can they not let it go? Why do they not ask themselves? Why does not a reasonable priest or rabbi or any religious person with a warm IQ, room temperature <laughs> IQ, why has it never struck into them? Wait a minute. None of us, even the church fathers, even those better learned, more enlightened than I am, they admit that the third force just seems to have absolutely no reasonable explanation. It's just beyond comprehension. They all admit it. Why have we had a history of 2,000 years and we can't let go of it? I mean, why come nobody has ever just said, why, had, why didn't a pope, for instance, show up sometime that went, by the way, we need to clean a little house, bring the church up to date, make everybody feel better. There's no sense beating, not dead horses, but beating damn Trojan horses, empty horses. That, all right, for instance, I've been going down the list here since I was elected pope the other, last week. One of them, this thing about there being three forces. I know it's always sounded right. I had to you know, answer that when I was in theological school myself. <laughs> They'd say, what, you know, how, many, how many parts are God? And I'd write three. But we admit, the church admits so we can't explain it. And it strikes me that it might behoove us all intellectually since we've had 2,000 years to at least ask ourselves the question, what the hell do we keep you know, hanging on to it? If we don't understand it, how about let it go? <laughs> Does anybody ever ask that? No. Everyone, at least half the people on the planet at any given time can look at the other half, whatever they're doing, their religious activities, their political interests, and make fun of it. To criticize it on a rational basis. But they never ask themselves this. What if both of these are equally ridiculous? Now, that's, not, that's still not it, see. I've tried to take you there a long, long time ago. It's beyond that. It's just, all right, how about that third view? Like, how come, how come nobody considers that they most about, might be equally ridiculous? Not that they might, both might be, that they both might be equally valid, they both might be equally invalid. Here's the father, there's the son. Or, okay, there's the father, there's the son. Now we're looking for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would be, the, wait a minute, both of those might be equally as valid or invalid. Okay, we almost got something except for this. Here's the other one, the higher one. Why has no one ever considered that? All right, what it does is it puts you back at a point blank to end up the tape. Position of you having to see that God is one. That there is indeed one law running the universe. And once you become more conscious, you know what it is. You don't have to wait for all these physicists to work on it. Because if they work on it, all they're going to do is slap Brahma on the back. And he'll inhale and start all over again. <laughs> There's one law. I hate to put a name on it, but it went in the tape. How about the point blank law? How about the in your face God? The in your face God, the point blank God... He ain't divisible. And everybody that says he is, ain't seen him point blank. I rest my case. It is self-evident. It is self-correcting. It is known as a tunnel of love from which there is no way out. <laughs> Once you get in there, you're faced with it. I guess you can drown yourself and go back to being ordinary and come swimming out and go, I was wrong. I thought the tunnel of love was one. I thought the law was one. But thank God, as I was going down for the third time, drowning there in the tunnel of love when I followed the boat, going down for the third time, it struck me. The mystical insight.